Okay, so today um, in our uh, Sunday School lesson, we're going to be looking at the love expressed in God's name. This is uh, a continuation of this series um, on God's name. Uh, so uh, that is uh, what we're going to continue to look at, okay? Um, now, I think anybody who is a believer, who knows the Lord, um, uh, knows that God loves us. I think that that's uh, apparent, but I also think at times in our lives, I think that, um, that we can also forget that God loves us. Not, not that we don't know, but it just kind of drifts away. So just, to, you know, I'm going to have lots of interaction so anybody can answer questions. Um, so what are some ways in which we know that God loves us? What are some ways that we know that God loves us? His word tells us. That's, you know, that, 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 should be, that almost should be good enough for us. I mean, we know that God's word is true, and if it says that God loves us, um, we should just accept that that is true. What are some of the things that, that God has done for us that demonstrate his love towards us? He gave, he gave his only son on the cross. I mean, he gave, the, you know, the unspeakable gift. You know, it's, it's Christmas time, and, you know, when I think of Christmas, it, it's not even so much the, okay, you know, a baby was born, and obviously that baby was Jesus, but it's that fulfillment of God's promises, that he kept his promise that he was going to send a redeemer, you know, that he was born and then would eventually you know, live a perfect life, a sinless life, and then give his own life on the cross so that we can be made uh, right with God. I mean, that is uh, the wonderful reason why we celebrate great Christmas. So, with that, why do you think sometimes that we might, for, like, I, 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 I use the word forget because as I think, again, we know, like if someone said, you know, does God love you? It's like, I don't know, I don't remember. Um, why do you think sometimes maybe that kind of maybe drifts off into the background and we're not maybe constantly thinking about that or thinking about it as much as we should? Mm-hmm. Like I, I saw God work in my life yesterday, but now I'm you know it's a new day and I forget these things and I uh, forget sometimes. Yeah, and I think I think I think I think another thing that can happen is I think we can like I don't want to say minimize, but it's like okay you know God does something wonderful for us and we rejoice and then it's like oh okay you know, and then maybe we forget that oh was that really God that helped out there? Or, you know, what about today and my problems today? Anybody want to add? I, think, I, I don't know that it's forgetting as much as it's taking for granted. I think that that's um, a good point, yeah. Like, I mean, we, and we, you know, and, and we do, we can see it in our lives with our spouses, our parents, mm -hmm. our children, we all do the same thing. I mean, I saw a study the other day that said uh, the average person tells their spouse they love them twice in a day. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that those are good answers. So today we're going to look at Psalm 103. So uh, this is a wonderful psalm. I mean, uh, there's just so much in it. Um, now, if, if you can, of course, look in your book, but if, if you actually want to get your Bible out, you can do that as well. And, um, you know, that a, a, lot of the, a lot of psalms, they have these subtitles in them where uh, these aren't inspired words of scripture, but uh, they give a subtitle, and for Psalm 103, it says, A Psalm of David. And, you know, the book actually emphasizes here that, um, that when it talks about a psalm of David, this is more than just something that was written by David. Like, okay, yes, David was the author of this psalm, but in many ways, this is very much an expression of David's soul and his heart uh, for the Lord. 
And we definitely see in the psalm that David is pouring out his heart to the Lord. Uh, now, I know many of you in here uh, are very familiar with David. I'm not sure how familiar everybody is. But just to do a recap, David was king in Israel uh, around uh, a thousand years before Jesus was born. And uh, this is the same David that we talk about when we talk about David and Goliath, where David slew, slew Goliath. As a young boy, he was a shepherd. And, um, you know, he was somebody who even at a young age uh, served the Lord and uh, he was anointed by Samuel to be king after Saul. So this was actually early in his life. He was sort of uh, given this, this, this blessing or this promise from God that, you know, he was going to be king uh, later in his life. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, God describes uh, when it, uh, David is he, he's described as a man after God's own heart. And that's something that, that God even puts that description upon him. So uh, we know that, and, and again, I think if, if, if you read many of these psalms, you, you, can, you can tell that, that David was a man after God's own heart. I mean, he was somebody who loved the Lord. And in many ways, that's what made him such a great king, not because of his own personal strengths and whatever he had, but because, you know, he realized he had to rely on the Lord for those things. Um, but... You know, is David a perfect person? <laughs> okay, no, right? <laughs> Probably anywhere close, and, or any, anything but perfect. And, you know, David faltered. Can anybody maybe remind us of some ways that David stumbled and faltered in his life? He didn't always do the right thing? Yeah, I think the one that comes up the most is uh, David and Bathsheba, so... There's a story, and we're not going to go there for time's sake, but, you know, David, you know, lusted after this woman Bathsheba and committed adultery with her, and then to cover up that sin, he, he was like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, she, first of all, she, in adultery, she, she conceives, and he's like, well, I, I want to try to, you know, make it the husband's kid, you know, try to pass it off, because he was off to battle, but you know, he wouldn't have relations with her, so he ultimately ends up having the husband killed by proxy. Um, he wasn't the one who did it with his own hands, but he gave the order for that to happen, and, you know, there were terrible, terrible consequences uh, because of those sins. But even so, uh, uh, God describes David as a man after God's own heart, and even if you look later on in Kings, you, you so that this would have definitely been the future. This would have been after David died. There were several kings where, you know, this person, you know, followed after me, but not like David did, you know. Always kind of looking at David, not as, not as an example of perfection, but as an example of, like, this is somebody who followed after me. And, and how could God possibly describe David after, as a man after God's own heart, even after David did all these things? How could that be? Well, no one, no one gives up, you know, no one honors the Lord all their life, all the time. Mm -hmm. So, David, one of the things maybe that comes to mind is David trusted the Lord in certain ways that many people were unwilling to do so. Mm -hmm. But no one stepped forward to save Goliath. Right. Yeah, so Ben was saying how, you know, you know, even though David, like most people, you know, doesn't live a perfect life, you know, he trusted God in many situations. And you know, even the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. He certainly had faith in God. And we know that, as, as New Testament believers, we know that our justification is not in ourselves and how good of a life we live, but it's in faith in Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, you know, the faith in God, you know, that, that David was, was looking toward the Messiah um, uh, was an example of how we can see that David was justified and right in the eyes of God. And I think with that in mind, uh, we can jump to Psalm 103. So we're going to read this. Um, would somebody like to read the first five verses? Okay, Christina. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. 
forget not all his benefits. He forgiveth all thine iniquities, he healeth all thy diseases. He redeemeth thy life from destruction, he crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. Okay, very good. So what I almost like to do when I kind of do Bible study is I kind of almost like to do like a kind of a verse-by-verse -verse analysis. That's, that's where I tend to feel the most comfortable, trying to stick close to the Scripture, trying to look at these things. Um, so we'll go back to verse 1, and we'll kind of look at things one verse at a time here, and I'll ask some questions along the way. So we start off, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And... Uh, a couple of things that I think we could point out here is that, you know, even though this is sort of like a, I don't want to say it's like in the third person kind of, but, you know, he's, re he's referring to God in the third person. I would still say this is a prayer. This is something that, God, that, that David is pouring out to God. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it says here, you know, and all that is within me, you know, I think you know, prayer is something that is an important part of the Christian life. Um, but I don't know if anybody here is like me, but does anybody like sometimes kind of like, I don't know, pray very casually, like, Lord, thank you for the day, bless the day, you know, just thank you for all you do for me, amen. You know, anybody pray like that sometimes where it's like, like kind of like a, like a quick, so uh, is this the type of prayer here that David is doing? Like one of those kind of just quick, casual yeah, no. I mean, it says here, and all that was within me. I mean, he, he, he's pouring out his soul um, to the Lord here, uh, pouring out his heart. Um, in verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And I, I think that's kind of that allusion to what we talk about. You know, we forget that God loves us. We forget his benefits. And he, he's sort of, it's that reminder not to forget all his benefits. And, you know, when we read this, we can think about the benefits that applied directly to David in his life, but I, I also believe that this extends to the benefits that he extends to, you know, anybody who's a believer. And I would even go so far as to say even people who aren't believers, that he gives opportunities um, to get to know him. You know, what are some of the Lord's benefits? Like, be specific. What are, what are some benefits we have by knowing the Lord? Our health, our strength, our capacity. Yeah. And again, I think those even extend to people who aren't believers, you know. I mean, the fact that we even have our health, our strength, I mean, our breath, right? Do you tell yourself to breathe every morning? Is that how that works? Tell yourself to wake up? You know, it's the Lord who sustains us. Those, those are some of his benefits. And just as Bill Johnson was saying earlier, uh, you know, we can take those things for granted. You know, we can't just, like, we shouldn't take them for granted. We should praise him for even those little things in life. And I think sometimes, you know, we, I always kind of heard, you know, we don't, we don't, we sometimes don't remember all that we have until we lose them. You know, and maybe we don't have the health we used to have, or we don't have the, the strength and the capacity to do the things we used to do, then it's like, oh man, you know, I, you know, I kind of took that for granted, but we, we shouldn't take it for granted. Um, and when we bring these to, to, to memory, how, how do you think that helps us? Yeah. Uh, you know, versus just be, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like our kids. Our kids only came to us when they, you know, needed something for school, but forgot that, you know, and were scared to do it because, you know, they forgot that we fed them every day, clothed them, and housed them, and, you know, but yet they were terrified to come to us for it. Yeah. So Bill was kind of alluding to how, you know, we can easily forget when God kind of meets our ordinary needs. You know, I think sometimes, 
I don't know if anybody falls in this thing, but sometimes we think, oh, well, that's just too small for us to go to God with it, you know. And it's like, there's really nothing too small. Like, Lord, I pray that you, you know, help me get to church safely this morning. You know, something really simple like that. Or, Lord, uh, <laughs> I don't, you know, I, you know, I, I yeah. There's, there's, there's so many things. I, it's, it's so easy to forget that. And, and, and obviously the Lord is so gracious, you know, even if we, we don't ask for that, you know, he still provides protection and he provides help and <laughs> whatnot. So, um, you know, all those things. Uh, but, you know, once we, when we trust him for the ordinary things, then we're maybe more likely to trust him for things that are more extraordinary because to God, they're, they're, they're equally small to him. Like, the, the, like, you know, him, you know, providing a big financial need or him is, 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 is just as easy for him for me to have strength to be able to walk to the door over there when I'm done with uh, preaching or giving this message, I guess. It's lesson. So that's the idea. Um, and, 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 and the Bible, of course, here goes into what some of those benefits are. Verse 3, you know, who redeemeth... Uh, thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Um, it's always interesting um, when, when the Bible uses that word forgive. Um, uh, it, uh, in the Hebrew there, uh, God is always the subject. It's never a person forgiving somebody. Um, it's God uh, forgiving. And, and why do you think that is? Right, you know, I mean, we, we, we sin against people, but ultimately that sin is against God. Ultimately, anything that is sinful is a sin against God, and we need to go to forgiveness from God. Um, obviously, we should still seek restitution. We should seek forgiveness from the person we offended, but um, God is the one who we've offended. You know, it's sad to say this, but when you think about it, I mean, we've probably, you know hurt God more than we've hurt other people in terms of what our actions do. I mean, you know, even the worst sins we commit against another person is, you know, and, and the fact that he still loves us, the fact that, you know, he still forgives all, our, all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Um, so here's, uh, this is a pretty basic question, but if, if we know the Lord is Savior, how much of our sin does God forgive? Does he just forgive this amount? Does he, like, how much of it does he forgive? He forgives all of it, right? That's what it says, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. It doesn't say who forgiveth uh, just that one time or that over there. You know, he forgives all thine iniquities, okay? Um, it even says here that God is the one who heals, you know, all of our diseases. And, and, and of course, it's important for us to understand here that this does not mean that if I just have enough faith in God that, you know, I'm never going to get sick, or I'm, you know, God, it, that's clearly not consistent with Scripture. You know, any time that we read something in the Bible, um, it's always important that we compare it to what it says somewhere else. Um, you know, some people might read that verse and think, well, you know, if I just really believe hard enough and someone has cancer, then you know, I can just pray that and God's going to take it away. Now, he certainly can, okay, but the Bible also says that it is appointed point demand once to die and therefore the judgment. So, you know, because of our sin, there are still physical consequences. But, you know, if you think about it, though, even when it comes to sickness and health and whatnot, um, you know, we can take medication, we can go to the doctor, um, but at the end of the day, isn't it God who's the one who has to, who, who, who gives that initiative to provide the healing? He might use the doctor, you might use the medication, you might use our health choices, but ultimately we have to, we should praise God when we're healed, because he's the one that ultimately does that. Um, and I think most importantly when it comes to sicknesses, you know, God is the one who heals us of our, our the sickness of our sins, uh, which, is, which is really the bigger sickness, you know. I think of that passage in the Bible where you know, God heals a man, but he first says, you know, thy sins be forgiven. And it's like, oh, 
That seemed like it was pretty small. Like, that was the bigger miracle that he forgave sins. It wasn't, you know, the, it wasn't the small thing of actually making some lame man to walk. Um, so, um, and again, think about specifically, you know, what was David forgiven of? I mean, a lot. He's forgiven of his sin with Bathsheba. Say? Murder, adultery, yeah. lust, you know. And yeah, I mean, his hiding of sin. Yeah. Mm hmm. Right. Mm hmm. And, and keep in mind, were there consequences for his sin? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think he had a child that died because of it, and he had some turmoil in his kingdom. I know his, his, his I think Absalom was his son that, that, you know, caused all sorts of problems. Um, but in terms of his relationship with God, um, he was able to have restoration. And, you know, I, I always think, you know, if, if God's willing to forgive us of sins, you know, you know, who are we to hold things against other people? It's just, we can't do that. Um, so verse 4, who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Um, you know, God redeems us, you know, both what I would say generally and specifically. You know, we can think of, you know, our general... Uh, Redemption, um, you know, because every person is uh, a sinner and is heading towards destruction. Uh, Romans 6.23, if you have that up there, uh, says, you know, for the wages of sin is death, okay? That is the destruction that we are all heading towards as sinners who don't know the Lord. But it says here that he redeems our life from that destruction. And how does God do that? What does he do? Just... Sweep the sin under the rug. Say, okay, you're forgiven. Right. I mean, it says up there, you know, that's the second part of that verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about this verse and this idea that, you know, God, God came after us. You know, it wasn't like, you know, we sinned and we had to find a way back to God. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's very different between biblical Christianity and most of the religions of the world, is that most of the religions of the world, it's about, you know, we, we sinned, and now we have to make up the difference and make our way up to, back to God. But with biblical Christianity, what we believe, God came down to us to redeem us. He's the one who did the, the pursuing. Um, you know, if you go to Romans 5, 8 now, if you have that one, um, the Bible says, uh, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, you know, God made that way back and redeemed us from destruction, and he's the one who took the initiative. He's the one who paid the price for it. Um, we don't earn our salvation with God. You know, what could we do to earn salvation? I mean, you know, even if I stopped sinning today, and lived a perfect life the rest of my life, you know, how could I pay, possibly pay for all of the sins that I've done so far in my life, you know? And even that, I'm not gonna, I, I probably won't go th th the rest of the day, you know, sinless, you know what I mean? And none of us will, so, uh, you know, we remember those benefits. And, um, and again, think about how God specifically redeemed David in his situation, you know, he restored him, uh, you know, when David confessed his sin about Bathsheba, you know, even David said that, you know, you should kill that person because Nathan the prophet kind of gave a, an illustration using a, a lamb, and again, for, for time's sake, um, I'm not even 100% sure where that is. I think it's in Samuel somewhere. Um, but, you know, God didn't kill him right then and there. He, 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 he restored him. Again, there were consequences. That's not to say that when we sin that there are no earthly consequences, but God still brings uh, restoration. 
and he goes after believers when they sin. He even goes after believers when they sin and seeks to restore us. You know, we think about how you know God redeems us from destruction when we're lost, and when we don't know the Lord. But when we know the Lord and we stumble and we backslide and we fall away from God, you know, God goes after us then to restore us. It's not just a one-time work. I mean, yes, it was a one-time work on the cross to forgive us of our sins, but God is constantly pursuing those who know him uh, to, to bring them back to restoration when we sin and when we fall. And it's a wonderful thing. Um, verse 5, uh, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy renew youth is renewed like the eagles. So here's a question now, because, you know, I think there's two sides of the coin, right? I mean, on one hand, on one hand you know, God gives mercy and that he doesn't give us the things that we do deserve. He redeems us from destruction, but he also gives grace. He gives us the good things we don't deserve. Uh, what, are some good th what are some things that God has given you in your life specifically that you don't deserve? Your daughter. Yeah, that's a blessing. This should be easy. My, my uh, current existence versus my past existence. Amen. Amen. I was having this conversation in my our group recovery work the other night with Doug Bolton. Where I am today versus 16 years ago is only by God. Right. And, you know, I think about, you know, this thing back here, this exercise, this gratitude list, it was kind of coming to my mind, you know, all the things that we can thank God for. Like, is it, should it really be that hard to think of a hundred things? And I'll confess, I don't think I've actually done this yet, but, um, you know, I, I've been doing some exercises where I just think of all the things that God has, has given me, you know, a job that I enjoy, that I don't just deserve, you know, a church family, you know, people that love me, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like when you actually, like, start to think about it, you're like, wow. I don't know, does anybody ever feel that way? You're just like, wow, all that God's done for me. Okay. Anybody else want to share? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, God doesn't give up on us. You know. I think, I think, you know, you've said that once in Pure Men, like, you know, if you're still alive and you're breathing, God hasn't given up on you. And Paul, you know, Paul said it when he was there to be dying. I finished the race. I fought a good fight because he knew he was going to die. If, if God hasn't taken your breath away, there's still something he's got planned for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you think of people who, like, I mean, I think of people who are in terrible situations, like, you know, you're in prison or you're, you know, in the lowest of the low, and yet you're still alive, you know, still hope. God can still do something with you. And, you know, I think when we're living in God's will like that, uh, it's the best. And, you know, it says here, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going based on what the book said about this, so don't take my word for it. <laughs> it's commentary. Um, but it was talking about like a twofold thing about renewed like the eagles. Like, 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 there's two, like one is that God is kind of like the eagle and that he's swift to renew us. He, he wants to restore us. He isn't just, he doesn't sit back and grovel and like, well, I'm going to make you suffer for longer. Just, you know. He, he, that's not what God wants. He doesn't want to just have us be miserable, okay? Now, that, that, that doesn't mean that God's going to just take away our suffering, okay? Sure, God gives us seasons of hardship and suffering, but it's not like God doesn't want us to have a renewed relationship with him if we don't have a relationship. It's not like he's, wait, he's like, well, you know, you have to suffer until that happens. He might use that to get our attention, but, you know, he wants somebody saved today, you know? He doesn't, you know, he, he wants that. And, and, you know, he renews us to strength like the eagle as well. You know, life can be hard, but God, you know, when he renews us, we can endure the trials of life. Okay, somebody want to read verses 8 through 14 now.
you know, I think some of these verses here, some of those precious in Scripture, especially when he describes, you know, what he does with our sins. Um, but again, we'll, we'll go through these. You know, a lot of this I feel like is, is many, a, a much a reiteration, but, you know, when the Bible reiterates things, it's, it's in many ways a volume control. It's like, this is important, okay? Um, if we go back to verse 8 here, and we'll look at 8, 9, and 10 together a little bit. You know, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. And this is a very common description of God. You know, this is not the only time where this verbiage is used, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. Um, You know, really, in many ways, it's, 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 it's not just what God does for us, but it is a description of God's character, of who he actually is. You know, I know we talked about praising God for what he's done for us. I think we had that lesson last week, but not just that, but praising God for who he is, for, you know, the type of God he is. Um, you know, I think sometimes we, we think of certain people in our lives who, you know, they're not merciless and gracious. They get angry quickly <laughs> and, and <laughs> aren't merciful at all. And maybe we have some people in our lives who fit that description, and God is not like that, Okay. Yes, Ben, we're talking about, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Only when you're on the road, Ben. Okay. That accident was not my fault. I know. <laughs> we're just making funny, we have to. Uh-huh. You know, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor re- rewarded us according to our iniquities. Um, you know, just in these verses, I just see a contrast between, you know, what we actually deserve from God and what we actually receive from God, you know. Like, I just think, I just look at verse 10, you know, he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Just a question, if God had dealt with us after our sins and rewarded us according to our iniquities, what would our situation be? Right. I mean, you know, it, 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 like, like if, if, like, you know, I, I was, I was finding it funny. It's like, you know, I wish I could just get what I deserve. You know, do you really want what you deserve? You know, hell. Like right now, boom, hell. Now that's what you deserve. Okay, you're a sinner. You deserve to die and go to hell right now. Okay, it says the wages of sin is death. That's what we we talked about earlier. What does that mean? That doesn't just mean physically dying. It means being eternally separated forever from God in a place called hell, which is this terrible place. But God doesn't just give that to us, okay? Why? Because, you know, he's merciful, he's gracious, he wants to redeem us, okay? He's a just God who will not overlook our sins, okay? Um, uh, And, you know, many times when it talks about, you know, these verses about God, you know, it talks about how he, he, you know, he, he, he... he does not overlook our sins. But he also talks about how he's merciful. It's like, how can that be? And the answer is Jesus Christ. That's how it can be, because he places the wrath that we deserve upon Jesus. You know, every sin that has ever been committed has to be paid for. And it's paid for in one of two ways, either by Jesus on the cross or by us spending eternity in hell. There's no other option. It doesn't get swept under the rug. And the fact that there is the option that Jesus, you know, can take that punishment for us, you know, such a, you can't even put into words. You can't even put into words. Um, and, And as we talked about earlier, you know, this doesn't mean that there's no consequences. You know, David suffered the consequences for his sin, but did he get what he deserved? No, he didn't get what he deserved. Okay. If anything, I almost think that sometimes, you know, those consequences that God gives us, even when God makes our life a little bit more difficult when we sin or does something, is even that is a restorative work. He wants to bring us back. You know, he wants to use that, those consequences, to bring restoration, to work through that. Um, and I'm sure you can attest to that, though. Mm-hmm. You know, there comes a point where God's not going to strive with, not going to deal with it anymore. Mm-hmm. He's not going to withhold his anger from punishing us. There comes a point where we, his mercy is, 
dealt in correction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and we, as a Christian, if you run from God long enough, he will eventually pull you back. And you, the, the destination isn't always what we want. But I, I'll, I'll ask you a few questions. And I, we, don't, we're not, we're not, we don't need to necessarily share all the details, but I know your story. But when you were at your low pop point, you know, God certainly dealt with you. And I guess here's a question. In that low point, was it comfortable? Well, no, you know, and, and, and I always say it this way. Running from God in sin will put you in one of three places, a hospital, a jail, or a morgue. Mm -hmm. And I was blessed that I got to go to, I got to, go to jail. Mm-hmm. Right, and think had, about... Had I not, had God not stopped me when he did, I would not be here today. Because I would have been, it, it, the, the destruction that would have been caused and the death, there, so God, eventually got his correction in the way he knew it would work. And then look at where he's brought you to buy today. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's going to be maybe a little bit too hard for me to summarize everything that, that, <laughs> that, that, Bill, that Bill said for those of you who are at home, but um, just to keep it short, you know, God can take situations when we're on a path of destruction. We'll use his, his buddy Larry Scrant, who's, who's been here, who, you know, was, you know, lifetime in prison, and, you know, God you know, had to use those consequences to get to him, but now he's been 20 years in the ministry, full-time ministry serving the Lord, and sometimes God has to use that to, as a, and again, as a restorative work. Yes, it, on the surface, it just looks uncomfortable, and it looks like punishment, but on the back end of it, God is restoring us through that. Um, I, I just love these verses, 11 and 12 here. I, 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 does anybody else love these verses? Okay. <laughs> um, it says, you know, for as, as, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is, as, as, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And we understand, of course, that this is figurative language. I mean, sin isn't like a location type of specific thing here. But it's, it, it's just to go to show you, you know, how, like, like how far is the east from the west? Like, <laughs> right? <It's, laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're just, they're opposite directions, right? It's just north and south, but, you know, east and west, right? It's, they're, they're, One's one way, the other's the total opposite way, right? So if, if we're over there, our sins are over there, you know? They're just, you know, that's, that's the way. Like, God doesn't, you know, I think it says in the Bible that God forgets our sins, okay? Not that he doesn't know that it happened. Chooses to forget our sins. Um, and not, obviously, he's omniscient. He knows what's happened, but he, he doesn't, like, I don't know. Do we know people who, like, hold things against other people, hold grudges? Like, does God hold grudges? No, he doesn't hold grudges, you know. And, um, yeah, he doesn't remember our sins. He chooses to forget them. Again, this does not mean that there are no earthly consequences. We already talked about it. You know, a lot of times those consequences are there as a restorative work. It's not because he's angry with us. It's because he loves us. Okay, it's out of his love that he allows us to go through consequences so that he can, re so that he can redeem us. Uh, but do we forgive the way that God forgives that often? No. Are we forgiven by others the way that we are forgiven by God? <laughs> yeah. 
as Christians, should we strive to forgive like how God forgives? It says here in verse 13 and 14, you know, like, as the Father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. And I, I don't know, I, I feel like every time I read these verses, it's like you just, you get the sense that God, like, I don't want, I never want to say, God doesn't tolerate our sin. As I said, it has to be paid for on the cross. But he understands that we do sin. Like, he gets it, you know. He, like, I mean, it says that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Um, You know, even in Genesis 3, God, you know, made a promise of the Redeemer immediately after sin. I mean, did, did us sinning in the, did Adam and Eve sinning in the garden catch God by surprise? No, it didn't, it didn't catch God, God by surprise. And, um, and, and just, just, like, he, he, he knows that we're not going to do things perfectly. And I'm the type of person who I put sometimes a lot of stress on myself to do things perfectly. And, you know, I had a good conversation with Pastor. And in some ways that can be selfish because it's not on us. It's on Jesus to redeem us. And uh, that's... It, you know, it's not thinking about ourselves more and how good we are and how not good we are. It's about um, what Jesus has done for us in living that way. So how, how do we know that this is true? How do we know that God understands our frame? That, you know, he pities us and knows that we're not perfect. Yeah, because of his grace. I mean, he made a way. He made a way back. And he knew we'd, he, he knew he'd, we, we, that we'd, we'd need a way, to, you know, back to him. And he's the one who, who did all that work so that we could. And, you know, God even, you know, he even works in our lives and we, we're not perfect, you know. Uh, we use the bad analogy of a father and a child. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you could talk to kids at a maturity level. You could they just sometimes they get into bad habits. They and they mess up a lot. <laughs> yeah. And they, they do a lot of bad things. Mm-hmm. You know. And the love that the father or the mother has for their child, even though the child is not behaving perfectly or in the way that they should all the time, the love that the parent has is still always there and it's just a amazing thing to try to understand and that that verse 13 that's what that verse is is talking about you know that's the relationship that god has with us yeah um i mean it doesn't matter if you're 15 or 90 we're still just like a child in god's eyes Mm -hmm. Sometimes you talk to people and it's like, it's 40, 50 years old. Like, why are, you know, but the parents still talk to their kids, adult children now, mm-hmm. as though sometimes it's sort of their little kids. Mm-hmm. And I always thought that's so funny. Yeah. But God in these verses is kind of like that mm-hmm. in a way. I don't know, it's just, the love though is there. Well, I know both of you guys are parents, so... Can you relate to that as mothers? You know, how you know, your children don't always do what you want them to do, but you still love them. And you, like, like you, what does it say? Pitieth your children, and you, you, you like, they don't do the right thing, but you, you, you get it. You know, and, and I, think, I think in some ways, you know, it's, it's easy for us because we've been there. We've been children. Like, you ever, like, I don't have kids, but you're like, you work with kids, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember when I went through that, and oh, uh, yeah. And, you know, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, even God can say that, because he lived as a man, you know, 
like, you know, it says that, you know, you know, he was tempted in all wise, but, you know, I mean, like, God, like, doesn't just, like, in his head know how it is to be a man, but he personally experienced it, and he, he, he understand like, just to think that Jesus, like, understands, like, every temptation we go through, personally, right? I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But when they don't, we know that we're going to have some correction and discipline that we don't want to do. Yeah. And that's, that's where, where the Bible talks about the pity of it. Right. About it, yeah. Sorrow. And, it, and it's kind of, it's, I don't know if you ever think this way, but you know, like when you think about like, like if, you, if you actually take a step back, right, and you think about living the Christian life, you think to yourself, you know, if I just did everything God told me to do, my life would be great. I mean, I'm not saying it, would be, it wouldn't have problems, but I mean, like, the best possible life I could possibly live would be the one that's in God's will, whatever that happens to be. Like, there's no better alternative, okay? And yet, we want to do things our own way. And, and, it's, and, and like, sometimes I think to myself, like, why do I, why do I constantly do this sin? Or why, like, like, my life would be better if I wasn't doing this, or if I wasn't, you know... And yet here I am, a stubborn, stupid, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and God knows, you know, and he, like, like, he doesn't give up on us, okay? We'll just look at these last few verses pretty quickly here, 17 through 19. We can cut it? Yeah, we'll cut it, that's fine. Okay, I'll read one verse because I think it's important. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children. I mean, um, yeah, he just, he's, um, I mean, everlasting to everlasting, you know. Like, I don't want to say that God's patience doesn't run out in the sense that, like, if, if, if you don't accept Jesus as Savior, there is a cutoff and, you know, you will spend eternity in hell. But, you know, when you know him as Savior, um, you know, upon them that fear them, right? For, who are the people who fear the Lord? Those are the people who have trusted in him, right? You know, we have everlasting mercy from the Lord. And, I don't know, I think this is a lesson that, you know, we can walk away with gratitude for how much... God has done for us and how much he truly just loves us. I mean, that's what the lesson is about. It's about, you know, his love for us. So, okay, we'll close in prayer. Father in heaven, help us not to forget your benefits, as it says here in the psalm toward us. Um, We're sinners. We don't always do the right thing. And... But you're gracious and you're merciful towards us. You give us second and third and fourth and fifth chances and more (laughs) than we possibly can deserve. And I just pray that, uh, again, these weren't my words, but these were your words, that uh, that this is a blessing to those that that hear it here this morning and also online. Um, I just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.